Welcome to the Tank Museum Bobbington, England, and another in the Challenger series. Today, as I'm sure you recognise, I'm standing in front of the Russian KV-1 heavy tank. If you'd wondered what the KV stands for, it's Clemente Voroshilov, after the Russian Commissar who was in charge of defence. In some ways, the KV-1 has been eclipsed by the legendary T-34, which came soon after. But the KV-1 was a formidable beast in its own right, and came as a big surprise to the Germans when they invaded Russia in 1941. Back then, the KV-1 could outfight any German tank on a one-to-one -one basis, and just as important, most German anti-tank guns couldn't stop it either. Let's take a closer look and find out why. There's no substitute for thick armour, and the KV-1 has plenty of it, between 75 and 90 millimetres on the hull front and the turret, depending on the variant. This is actually a KV-1B with the thicker armour. At the time of the invasion, no German tank had a gun powerful enough to penetrate it. Even the Panzer Mark IV with its short barreled 75 millimetre gun could only penetrate 50 millimetres of armour at 500 metres. On the other hand, the KV 76.2mm gun could penetrate between 70 and 90mm of armour, easily punching through the 50mm frontal armour of the Mark IV, which was then the heaviest tank Germany had. To give you the true measure of this tank on the battlefield, in August 1941, barely two months after the first attack, a column of the German 8th Panzer Division drove into a well-planned ambush by five KV-1s near Leningrad. After two hours, a total of 43 German tanks had been knocked out by just those five KVs, and the advance was stopped dead. One KV-1 received 135 hits without a single one penetrating it, let alone disabling it. Despite this, the KV-1 was not a completely good tank, mainly because the crew arrangement was not ideal. There were five crew in total. The driver sat front centre, and to his left sat the radio operator, who also fired the 7.62mm machine gun. No real problems there. But it was the construction of the turret that caused the main difficulties. In most tanks of the time, turrets had a turret basket or floor on which the crew stood. So, as the turret rotated, the crew were carried around with it. But the KV had no turret basket, so when the turret rotated, the commander, gunner and assistant driver stroke mechanic had to shift themselves around with it, stepping on empty shell cases and discarded shell containers. Not only this, but the commander had simply too many things to do. Not only did he have to command the tank, directing it over the battlefield, looking for targets and threats, but he also had to load the main gun and fire the coaxial machine gun. As if this wasn't enough, the tank also lacked an all-round vision cupola. Speaking as a former tanky myself, it must have been hell. But the gun itself was good. The 76.2mm ZIS-5, almost identical to the gun fitted to the T-34. Right from the start, there was a variant of the KV-1, which was known as the Large Turret KV, but later redesignated the KV-2. It was built as a breakthrough tank or bunker buster and mounted a 152mm howitzer that could punch through 72mm of armour at 1500m a truly terrifying sight on the battlefield. 
and just as good as the KV-1 at soaking up enormous punishment. The KV's engine was excellent and went on to power the T-34 as well. It was a 38.8 litre V12 diesel, pumping out 550 brake horsepower and propelling the tank with a road speed of 34 kilometers per hour at a cross-country speed of 16 kilometers per hour. It also had a better range than the Panzer IV. The suspension was taken from an earlier tank, the twin turreted SMK of 1939. It used torsion bar suspension, a system that the Germans would later employ on the Tiger and Panther. But good though all this was, the tank was just too heavy and got heavier as the need for more protection grew. As the weights went up, the tank became slower and the army argued that the T-34 was really the sort of tank which the mobile warfare in Russia demanded. After all, it had the same gun, so it could deal just as much damage and it could move faster. Plus, its sloped armour, whilst not as thick as the KVs, was still highly effective. The first attempt to prolong the life of the KV came with the KV-1S in 1942, which improved mobility by lightening the tank by five tonnes. This was achieved by casting a smaller turret and reducing the hull side armour from 90mm to 75mm. The redesigned turret also made life easier for the commander, who no longer had to double as loader and now had an all-round vision cupola. Despite these improvements, by 1943 it was outclassed by the Tiger I and Panther. Its thinner armour was no match for their sheer firepower and its own 76mm gun was hopelessly inadequate against the thick armour of these new German tanks. The final attempt to keep the KV going came with two major variants. The first of these was the KV-85, featuring a bigger turret, originally intended for the IS-1 heavy tank, mounting an 85mm gun. The second was the SU-152 self-propelled assault gun, with a 152mm howitzer mounted on the KV-1 chassis. But the KV days were now numbered. The new IS series of tanks would be better in every way. Nevertheless, it should not be forgotten that for the first 18 months of the invasion, the Germans had nothing to match it. Its ability to soak up and shrug off hit after hit while steadily returning fire with its 76 earned it a formidable reputation. <laughs>